gentlemen, let's go out and visit Jack Benny at his home in Beverly Hills, where at the moment we find Rochester trimming his hair. Uh, just a little more off the side, Rochester. Yes, sir. You know, Rochester, it may sound funny, but when I was just a little kid, I, I had the most beautiful head of thick golden curls. You did, boss? Yeah. In fact, my mother was so proud of them that she gave a curl to every one of our relatives. Well, you better write to them, boss. It's time to get them back. <laughs> yeah. Hold it, Rochester. How much have you trimmed off the sides? Almost a handful. Good. Now sprinkle it around the top. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> what are you laughing at? This ain't no haircut. It's a landscaping job. <laughs> well, it's a little trick I learned in agriculture school. Good old fertilizer tech. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm nearly finished. Good. How does my hair look? Fine, boss. You want to put it on now? <laughs> yes. Hold the mirror for me, please. Hmm. You know, Rochester, I can't understand how the hair on a toupee can grow. The ones you buy stay the same, but this is one of those you trapped yourself. <laughs> well, I only trapped a few. Yeah, but you better get rid of that one with the white stripe down the middle. You're losing all your friends. <laughs> yeah. Now, Rochester, will you please brush the hair off my neck? Okay. I'll open my shirt first. Yeah. Say, boss, uh, why do you wear that penny around your neck on a string? It's for sentimental reasons, Rochester. This is the first penny I ever owned. Oh. And you know that dollar I have framed in my bedroom? Mm-hmm. That's the first dollar I ever owned. Oh. And you know that picture by Maxwell that hangs in the den? That's the first car I ever owned. That's the first car anybody ever owned. <laughs> what? That car scared more horses than the meat shortage. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Say, hey, boss, you, you want me to get a clean shirt for you to wear down the studio? Huh? You didn't forget your broadcast, did you? How could I forget? The broadcast, the broadcast, always the broadcast. Year after year. Every Monday, I think of ideas. Tuesday, I meet with my writers. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we write. Saturday, I rehearse. And on Sunday, I do my program, and one short half hour, it's all over. All that work for just one half hour. And for what, I ask you? For what? For a lousy million dollars. <laughs> no, no, Rochester, you have the wrong slant on life. Money isn't everything. Boss, wake up. Wake up. I am awake. <laughs> and I meant what I said. You know, Rochester, there's an old saying that the best things in life are free. Uh -huh. Money is not everything. Uh -huh. Look out that window. Look at the sunshine, the fresh air, the birds, the trees, the blossoms. Right down the street, you can see. Hey, here comes the mailman. Wonder if he brought my salary check today. <laughs> I hope so. What happened to the birds and the sunshine? Looks like rain, doesn't it, Roger? <laughs> What do you do besides show business? I've never heard. Well, all I... I don't do much of anything, except that I suddenly got... had, had great love for the violin in the last 10, 12 years. And I'll practice a lot now. This is my hobby. My hobby now is to practice. And I'll practice sometimes an hour, two or three a day. And I'll play golf. And I'm a lousy golfer, but I'll play, and I enjoy it. Uh, and outside of show business, that's about the only two things that I do. I love to travel. I love to travel by automobile a lot. I used to do that a lot. I used to travel across the country. My vacation used to be going from here to New York and back and things like that by automobile and be alone or, I mean, with one other person, another fella. And, uh, but uh, there's nothing else. I have no other hobby. Uh, it's difficult to call the violin. You can't call golf a hobby. That's not a hobby, you know. No, but, recreation. Yeah, that's all. But violin could be a hobby, you see, because I would love to be a real fine violinist if I could, but it's too late now. So I practice to be as good as I can. Speaking of automobiles, have you ever in your life driven a Maxwell? I may have, but I don't remember. <laughs> 
You don't remember? The Maxwell, the word Maxwell came out of any car we would have used as a gag. Could have been a an old Stutz, or it could have been a, uh, what do they call them? The, um, oh, any of the old name cars. Could have been anything. And we a, just happened to pick Maxwell, and that's the name that stuck. And an old friend. Just like Love and Bloom, my theme song, is a f number I used to fool with on the fiddle. You see? Now, any number that I would have fooled with in the fiddle with the fiddle at that time would have become my theme song, whether I wanted it or not. Identification. That's yes, because I would never pick Love and Bloom in a million years. I've often wondered how it came that's to be it, associated That's it, because I'd go places and then I'd hear the orchestras playing it for me. That means that I fooled around with it so much that, that it became my theme song. You couldn't stop it. I couldn't stop it. it today if I wanted to. There's another funny thing about your career, and it sounds odd when you mention it, but you got your start in broadcasting on the Ed Sullivan Show. Mm-hmm. Of course, most people have forgotten that he had a yeah, radio that's show. That's true, though. He did a radio show of news and sports, and once he asked me to be a guest on it. And this was after I had quit the show in order to try to get on radio. And I got on it, and we prepared a couple of gags together. And by God... An agency heard me for Canada Dry Ginger Ale, gave me a job. Got th through Ed Sullivan. And that was 1932. Yeah. Well, I probably would have got on anyway, but I still have to credit Sullivan with the start. When you look back on it all, it's, uh, it's been a pretty good life. Oh, yes. Yes, I must say. Now, I've had a lot of little worries in my life, but those are things that you bring on yourself. I really have had, and I certainly have had no health problems, no marriage problems. Uh, when someone says to me, how would you like to be 39 again? I say, no, sir. Only if I felt as good as I feel now. Why should I go back and put myself in a position with all the things that can happen to people today, overnight? When here I am at my age and have escaped all of that, why go back? I've been very fortunate, very lucky. Sure, the, my big fault is I've been very moody. I've been moody in my life. But that's something I couldn't explain. If you ask me why, I couldn't tell you. Because in two hours later, I'd feel like a million dollars. Were you glad that you were born at the time you were in history? Who knows? Now, let me ask you this. People say to me, Aren't you glad now that you didn't take the violin seriously? How do I know? Maybe I'd have been very happy being a great violinist, and I think I could have been. But it turned out so that both, I got the benefit of both. You know, you could say you're a comedian, and yet you're not a comedian. You're sort of a comic actor. Yeah, I'm, I'm more of an actor, I think, than a comedian. Gleason is. Well, Jackie Gleason is probably the best acting comedian we have in the business. Bob Hope is better as a monologist. Tell me, has humor changed very much in your lifetime? Or is humor basic? I think humor is basic. I think you've gotten to the point like everything has changed where you can be a little more risque. You see, I can do a lot of things there I wouldn't do on television. You know, mm. on the stage. Not only here, but in any theater. But uh, when I do risque material, I try to find a reason for it. Instead of doing it just to reach the risque part, there's a reason for my saying something. If I say something is risque, it could have something to do because I think a thing is too expensive or I think, and it leads into something risque. I never try to tell a gag, that a risque gag, just for the fact that it's risque, unless it has a good basic reason, sometimes a basic truth. You know the one I told about finding the little pad along the pool? The half of a Brazil. Yeah, that actually happened. And that's how we got the joke. It actually happened. Women were laughing. I looked down, there it was. Because you wouldn't make up a joke like that. You couldn't, you know. A lot of jokes are, are done that way or come from a basic truth. They're, they're drawn from everyday life. That's right. 
you take a thing like that. Now I found. Now you try to find. Oh, this this particular gag. My this writer that I tell you about gave it to me. He picked it up and he says, "I don't know if a woman lost this or a rat. There's a rabbi missing." <laughs> Now you gotta look down, you get the whole picture, look at down the pool and see if there's a rabbi down there. <laughs> and a rabbi, what's so ridiculous, a rabbi wouldn't actually be wearing that at a pool, you know. Yeah. But has it been a, a purpose of yours to observe humanity, to get your humor? Do you study people? Have you done that? I must have, I guess. I don't say that I just studied them. But I will, I wrote a whole routine once about the Fontainebleau Hotel in Miami just by sitting there watching a show once. And I wrote a whole routine that ran about two minutes. Now, that's a long time, you know. It doesn't sound long when you say two minutes, but you just sit here and wait for two minutes. You see how long it is. All about the hotel just by sitting there going through the lobby and watching the rooms and watching the people and everything. Observing. Observing. That's right. Tell me, what kind of a, a background did you come from? It's always interesting to ask no, a comedian that. No, not a show that. business background at all. No. Because you always look for reasons for people. Yeah, there, yeah. You look for reasons. You can't figure it out. My sister would have never been in show business. I just have the one sister. My father and mother were never in show business. They liked music. My mother played piano a little bit. They would have liked. The sad part of my life has only been, you see, my father did live to see me become somebody in radio, a big star in radio. He never lived to see it in television, but he lived to see something happen. My mother never did. My mother died before I had reached any of importance. And she was disappointed because she expected me to be a violin soloist, you know. Did your father live long enough to see a high school in Waukegan named after you? No, my father never lived to see this school named after me. How does it feel when you hear someone going to Jack Benny High? Yeah, they call it the 39ers. You know? <laughs> I go there once in a while and I, I hand out the diplomas. <laughs> and it's what's very funny to me uh, when, when the, the personnel who work there, when they answer the phone, hello, Jack Benny. <laughs> Which means Jack Benny High, you know, and I stand and I listen to it, you know. It's a beautiful school, very modern, you know. You've given Waukegan a lot of play. Well, you see, you can do it with a small town. You can't do it if you're born in Chicago. I was actually born in Chicago at the Mercy Hospital, but my mother carried me in Waukegan. You see, we lived in Waukegan. Uh, we only, she only went to Chicago to give birth to me, it was all to the hospital. Mm. You were uh, some while back mentioning being in the U.S. Navy First World War. Had you done anything prior to that? Yes, I did a fiddle act, violin, piano act, and show business. You must have been very young then. Yeah, I was just a kid then. So uh, you always wanted to do this kind of lark? Yeah, I was brought into it by a woman who used to do what they call piano logs. She used to sing and talk at the piano. And uh, she took me along. I was just a kid and gave me a little salary. And I played violin. We did a violin piano act. But uh, this did not please my mother. My mother, you see, my mother wanted me to be a soloist. But my mother and father never jumped on me, never made me do it. And that's the only way. That's the only way anybody becomes good. Heifetz's child life was just awful. Benny is your first name, isn't yeah, it, actually? Yeah, that's right. And, because, and the way I used Benny for a last name was that when this woman brought me in show business, the act was called Salisbury and Benny. And so when I went out on my own, even though Benny was my first name, I used it so much that I had to use it as a last name. And I had to find something to go with it. And Jack, I figure, went with anything. I didn't like when I first saw the name Jack Benny. It seemed ridiculous. Tell me, why are so many great comedians and humorists Jewish, particularly in America? I think what it has to do with, I think it's been persecution. 
And the thing that's kept Jews going was the fact you had to have a sense of humor almost to exist. And uh, some of the great actors, some of the great musicians, look what's happened in Germany, the great doctors, great scientists. Look what we've lost in science because of Hitler, who killed off six million. We, may have ha we might have had a cure a long time ago for cancer. Hmm. Hitler killed all of that. There were so many that were just killed, killed that could have young people. But humor does come out of suffering. I think a lot of it does. I think kids that are born very wealthy for some reason or other, it isn't always conducive to good comedy. Or you take, I never advocate a college. Am I right in advocating a college education for people who are going to be in show business? I think if they go to high school, that's enough. I'd say if you went through high school, and most of them didn't, I didn't at all, I just went through public school. I lost a lot. And I miss it too, I miss a good schooling. I miss a lot. And when people say to me, well, how much better could you do? Well, that's a silly question, because I could still do as well and still enjoy more of what I read and what I see, and my concentration would be better and everything. Just the fact that I've been successful doesn't mean that I couldn't be anyway. And then maybe again I couldn't have been. You never know. You never know. So I just have to be satisfied and just shut up. I think we can say you made it. I, yeah, I guess I made it. But um, I still go back to what we were first discussing. The hell with the past. It's today and what's going to happen, as long as I'm working.